really, really appreciate being in this space, uh, in Little Haiti, being at the Cultural Center. It's a site I was actually here for the opening many moons ago, um, and I was really inspired by the work that artists in the community did in pulling this together with cultural leader, with the municipality, um, but to see the way in which someone as an artist can be inspired, really inspired to build a site for art making and cultural memory and cultural expression is really great. So I'm thankful that not only did Ulaid and Locust come together to make this kind of programming, but you also collaborated again with another institution to really have me here. So thank you for that. Um, I've like come to understand that oftentimes these talks are a little bit of a personal testament from artists. Um, and sometimes, or sorry, from curators. I have also come to understand that in many ways people kind of give a little bit of a foretaste of what they're working on or what they're going to be presenting to the public soon. But I want to shift gears a little bit. So I'm going to talk about something that's come to the top of my mind lately. Um, and that is basically that the, recently the art world lost two lions. Um, and that is, they, those are BC Silva in February and Oak William Weiser just three weeks later in March. And I'm sorry, I'm a little bit emotional about this um, because these two premature deaths hit me um, quite hard. Uh, and in fact, I went to Munich earlier this year to say goodbye to Okwe just a couple of days before he passed away. Um, and so because of these recent deaths, it's, it's become important for me, I think, to start thinking through what their legacy is for the art world and really what their, um, what their influence has been on me personally. So here we go. Uh, both of these uh, curators worked independent, independently and at times within institutions across the art world, creating new models for curators who wanted to be rigorous without being academic or overly wonky. In Weiser, in addition to curating, was a founding, uh, a founding co-creator of Inca Magazine, the first journal dedicated entirely to contemporary African art. Silva um, had an expansive career, including founding the largest art library and research center on the African continent. And this project, the largest library and, uh, art library on the African continent, actually had a modest start with her own personal book collection. And above all, these two curators changed the terms of how we think about global art. Personally, I'm of a generation where engaging with the broad world is necessary, is a necessary part of cura curatorial practice. And so we can no longer sort of sit at home and in our home countries and home institutions, but all of us are starting to travel around the world. I return to Silva, Silva's and Mwaza's work over and over again as I try to work with art from outside the States, outside my cultural traditions, and outside my known world. And I would like to find a deeper meaning in their work for the work that I and many of my colleagues do. And so first off, I would love to dedicate this talk to their examples and to their memories. The similarities between Mwaza and Silva are uncanny. Both are from Nigeria. They're about, they were about the same age and each were dedicated to changing perceptions of Africa and African art. Previous to their arrival in the art world, or I should say their activity in the art world in the 80s and 90s, conversations in the States and in Europe about African art generally only referred to anthropological objects and spiritual sculptures such as masks, figurines, and amulets. You've all seen it in anthropology museums. In other words, African art only referred to objects colonials encountered in their scramble for Africa. Somewhere between this colonial period and the present, artists all over Africa, all over the African continent, had been working through their own modernist and contemporary art forms. But it seems that no historians outside of Africa were aware of these developments. But consider the landmark exhibition Musicien de la Terre at the Centre Pompidou, 
that went on in 1989. This was the very first major art presentation to call itself global. And this exhibition was made up of a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of the artists were from Europe and North America, so from the traditional West, and 50% of the artists were, were from the rest of the world. This show was a celebration of new international understandings in contemporary art, and the first time that Western art and non-Western artists sat next to each other in equal billing. It was a, a kind of corrective to, store, to shows that up until that point basically called all work from outside the West primitive. It was a great and groundbreaking exhibition, but very quickly certain shortcomings became apparent. So for instance, if you look at this installation shot, you'll see a work by Richard Long in the background. And in the foreground, there is a work by, uh, there is a sort of spiritual aboriginal, abor sorry, a Australian aboriginal uh, set of objects. And then on the right side, an Indebele house. But Richard Long is attributed in the show. The aboriginal work has no artist attribution, and nor does the Indebele house. So what looks like equality and egalitarianism on the surface still as an exhibition, the show applied different standards to the Western artists and the non-Western artists. So Silva and, and Wazer set to kind of um, doing corrective work against this kind of against these kind of oversights, and they used their vast intellectual resources to point out dump, d these double standards, and more importantly, to make new theses and tell new and different stories about art from the African continent. Now, I'm not an Africanist, so the question is, what on earth does this have to do with my work? And there is a kind of roundabout, more theoretical answer to this question, and so here this goes. The moment of my education was the high moment of identity politics art in the United States. It was a moment of increased participation, ostensibly on their own terms, for women artists and artists of color in the American art world. And now I get to historicize this identity politics moments from my hindsight vantage point of the present. And I I've come to think of it as one of the many varieties of postmodern art. But I also have the opportunity to critique identity politics as the art world still lives with and in uh, some of its terms and vocabularies and in my opinion, not in the most productive ways. I believe that the terms around black art and black artists in the United States, where I primarily work, is still limited and in constant need of expansion. I found that exchanging ideas with people of color from around the world, especially in the English-speaking world, because that is my primary language, those exchanges have been central to my work of constructing and reconstructing art histories. So for curators like Silva and Inwazer, their truly global outlooks have allowed me to place North American art, artworks in conversation with artworks across borders, geography, and time. Their outlook has also helped me locate blind spots in American art history and even in my own thinking. But there are a couple more simpler answers to why their work is important. There are kind of two interrelated reasons. And the first is, well, I'm basically an unreformed Pan-Africanist and love the work of the black diaspora. And two, I'm invested in reconstructing smarter art histories for uh, any artist, but especially for women and for artists of color. So now I'll try to walk through two exhibitions that I think uh, kind of demonstrate my cultural concerns in action and these concerns that have been really shaped by the work of the curators that I've, um, that I've dedicated this talk to. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, a place with a deep interest in Africa. I won't add years uh, for those of you who are interested, but let's just say <laughs> it's after the years of a deep kind of pan-Africanist thinking. And starting in the 1960s, many African-American artists, dancers, musicians, writers, actors, etc., all sorts of cultural workers, began to look to the continent of Africa for aesthetic inspiration and for a spiritual homeland. Black artists took refuge in Africa, both a real and an imagined Africa. 
as a counterpart to the trauma caused by racism, oppression, and legally sanctioned white supremacy in the United States. Mostly known as the Black Arts Movement, this Pan-Africanist cultural work had its greatest academic exposition in Robert Ferris Thompson's 1984 book, Flash of the Spirit, the African and African-American art philosophy. Sorry, African and Afro-American art and philosophy. As a Yale-trained professor uh, and a professor at Yale, Thompson argued that there was indeed cultural similarities between black communities all over the world, born from, the Western, from Western Africa, where the black diaspora originated. This is how I found myself, for example, taking West African dance and drumming classes as a teenager uh, on the south side of Chicago because this was just assumed as part of my heritage. But as a curator, I wanted to take that sense of heritage seriously. And one of my ways of doing that was to think through Pan-Africanism uh, in visual art and culture. And so I curated a show as a kind of love letter to a south side, uh, south side culture in Chicago. That exhibition, The Freedom Principle, Experiments in Art and Music, 1965 to Now, linked the vibrant legacy of 1960s African-American avant-garde to contemporary art and culture. And the show was occasioned by the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, or the AACM. And the AACM is a still active union of Chicago musicians whose interdisciplinary explorations expanded the boundaries, expanded the boundaries of jazz music, music. And this here is an image of one of the AACM subgroups, the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And here you can see how the art ensemble not only performed music, but they had this kind of costume play. So at this time, jazz musicians usually had this straight lace suit and a very skinny tie. And you can see these men are dressed like mad scientists, and especially like African griots. And often working alongside the AACM and collaborating with their performances were visual art collectives, such as the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, or Afrocobra. And note, the name of this collective that starts in Chicago starts with Africa. Africobra's public murals, printing studios, art workshops were part of a deep engagement with black cultural nationalism, both in Chicago and around the world, especially in an era that followed after civil rights. And so the Freedom Principle ostensibly looked at the formations of, African Ameri of the African American avant-garde, especially as it grew specifically out of Chicago in the 60s. And this was also a way for me to make an argument about how the avant-garde didn't just happen in New York, but it was also happening in cities around the Midwest and even on the West Coast. And it was a way for me to argue that there were real aesthetic forms and ideas undergirding the black arts movement. There were ideas about color and shape, about text and image, abstraction and figuration, still objects and performance art, and politics and beauty. More significantly, I wanted to point out that these aesthetic principles from the black art movements still inspire contemporary artists to this very day. And not only just African American artists, but these, these sort of principles and these aesthetics inspire artists all around the world. And in fact, within the contemporary section of the Freedom Principle, a full 40% of the artists were either from outside the United States or didn't even identify as black. And I think what I mean to say is that this sense of sort of black cultural tradition is one that belongs to the world, not just to black American artists. So if an interest in pan-Africanist ideas and, black arts and the black arts movement made me gravitate to the work of African curators, then there's one more lesson that I've learned from both Okwi and BC, and that is make a new master narrative. I've been trained as a very good postmodernist and a good feminist, I like to think, to discount master narratives altogether. But the value of a strong story is that it can displace other dominant and oftentimes toxic narratives. Silver and Wazer recreated narratives about Africa by curating shows with language about Africa's role as a modern continent. In Wazer specifically, 
wrote from a strictly cosmopolitan perspective about urban centers on the continent, as he was keen to rewrite not only African history, but world history, and really centralize Africa's place in it. So I've applied that same principle to artists I've worked with, especially when mounting monographic or solo exhibitions. Instead of repeating a known story by an artist or trying to slot an artist into an accepted and known art history, I want to look firstly at an artist's work and their personal develop and see if there's a way to make a new art history around that work. So I've had a chance to do that recently with a still touring exhibition called Haridina Pendale, What Remains to be Seen. This exhibition showcases the long career showing over 50 years of work of Pindell. And it gave me the opportunity not only to just look at Pindell's work in particular, but the, the development of American art history in specific. What does Pindell's work do for art history that's bigger than her studio practice? And how can Pindell become a test case from the transition from American modernism into postmodernism? And though she's a black woman of a certain age, Pindell avoided the black arts groups of the 60s and 70s, the kind of things that I address in the Freedom Principle. And she was much more known as a post-minimalist art. And in 1970, Pindell uh, developed an approach to painting that would revolutionize her work. Rather than applying paint freehand to canvas, the way we understand painting, you know, the way an artist will take a brush and put it on a canvas, uh, Pindell began creating these templates by punching hundreds of holes through stiff cardstock. And you can see that in the image in the center. And she would then sort of uh, affix a bunch of layers of these cardstocks together till she got a sheet that was about six or seven feet long. Um, and then she would affix these to the surface of her canvases. And you can see her doing that on, both, on the images on the left and the right. And then spray paint through those uh, templates. And she sort of had one for every color. And the results are um, a kind of painted surface with layers and layers of spray paint that basically look like veils of sheer fabric. And basically, you get a painting where the artist is never actually painting. She's never using a paintbrush. Pendel says this process was a response to the lack of natural light in her studio. And it was um, from her desire to find a way of working that was less dependent on sight. So she, with her sight, she could paint a precise image, but without the benefit of sight and natural light, she needed to do something that was all about the movement of her hands, about moving the templates around and then spray painting with the other hand. And later, as you can see in this work that comes a little bit after the early 1970 work, um, she developed another body of work where she apparently saved all the hole punches and all the chads from those earlier templates, and then begin to attach those to the surface of the painting. So you get this really incredible built up, um, built up canvas. And not only that, whereas before she um, had uh, works on stretcher bars, here she's creating these massive, massive scale works. I mean, look at the size of these bad boys, you know, seven by nine, 10 feet. Um, she's creating these by cutting pieces of canvas into squares and then sewing them together like a quilt. And then overpainting that, gluing all of this, these hole punches on the surface, overpainting again over that, and then adding glitter so the whole thing sparkles in the light. And then after that, she starts to add powder and perfume and treating the paintings as a metaphor for a woman's body. Pindell also had a double life. She was a curator by day, becoming the first black woman to hold a cur curatorial position at the Museum of Modern Art. So in fact, maybe I'd like to consider this talk an ode to three curators. Um, and at night, she would go into her studio as an artist. And though by 1979, she quits her job at MoMA, feeling pushed out due, due to her anti-racism political work. Politics had always been a big part of Pendell's life. And for instance, she was a committed feminist and a founding member of the still active AIR gallery, Artist in Residence Gallery in Brooklyn, which championed women artists. But for the longest time, Pendell always kept her politics separate from her artwork. So her artwork was abstract, 
but her politics was done sort of on the street and in her kind of collectus. Modern art dictated that politics had no place in art, but she experienced firsthand racism in the art world and came to understand by the 1970s that the art world was fair game for political criticism. Soon after leaving MoMA, Pendel was in a life, uh, well, a life altering, but also, um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the word, sorry, but a kind of uh, life-threatening car accident. And this sort of experience uh, of almost losing her life basically brought more political urgency to her art. So as before 1979, all of her work is fairly abstract. After 1979, you see the return of figuration and the inclusion of political messages in her work. And the first work that she completed after uh, leaving the hospital was the iconic video, Free White in 21. And it's a kind of confessional video where Pindell recounts moments of racism in her life. She plays multiple characters herself, telling these stories, and then another character in a blonde wig who tells her that she is lying and that she's crazy and overall, ungrateful. Ostensibly, the work is dedicated to the racism that Pendel also experienced with her second wave feminist colleagues. So this moment represents a great break in Pendel's work, not only in practice, but within her audience. This is a moment where she also uh, loses a great deal of her initial supporters. Those who loved her experimental abstract work thinks basically that she's lost the plot at this point. But she gained new fans in the African-American community and with a new generation of feminists. This is also to say that she captured the imagination of myself, yours truly. Free White in 21 marks the first time also in, P in Pindell's personal career that she appears physically in her artwork. And so now the body for Pindell is no longer a metaphor the way she treated the paintings like a body, but the body is a thing that begins to activate her artwork. So for Free Writing 21, Pendel speaks in first person. Um, and for then her next series of paintings, she actually begins to re-instantiate the figure, as you see here in this series. But what's interesting about the way in which the body reappears is that uh, it looks naive. It looks not sort of masterful, um, which is strange for an artist who's gone through about 20 years of art training at this time and who can paint and draw with absolute precision. Here, it looks like someone who can't paint and draw. And there's a reason for that. Here, instead of sort of drawing and painting onto the surface of the camera, uh, canvas, Pendel's actually laying down on canvas and tracing her body with her right hand. So she's drawing out an outline. And then she would take that outline and cut it out and then sew it back into another set of canvases. And so what you get here is a very literal and immediate way to include her bodily figure into the canvas. It's not drawn, it's really an outline of her and her art activity. And she includes her body so much so that in some of the works you actually see listed on the medium, her blood. So as I mentioned before, people thought of this figurative work as a kind of break from her old work, a kind of radical departure. But in many ways, they're an absolute continuation of the works that came before. You had already seen in her abstract work these large unstretched canvases, a use of mixed media, cutting and sewing, and then activating of her hand and her body. So what does this mean then to call Pindell's work after 1979 a new postmodern direction when she had already developed these ideas in the 60s and 70s. And perhaps we need to look again, and look back again and see how her work can change how we define painting altogether. Why is it that the work then from the early 60s and 70s was called modernist, when in fact it had a whole set of concerns that kind of had nothing to do with modernness? And if we pause for a moment, and stop to think about the direction of Pendel's work, or any artist's work for that matter, as a straight line moving forward in one direction, we can see how certain ideas and concerns were already active in her early mature work. And these concerns still activate the works to this day. Here's a very recent work, 
um, for the finish in 2016, where you can see what looks like a return to that early work. Um, but it's not a return. Again, they're all of the same spectrum. And so you can see the same abstraction, the same geometric forms, the shape unstretched canvas with a strong monochrome feel. But one thing that's really important for me for this work is the fact that it's a spiral. And a spiral is a line that moves forward but doubles back at the same time. And for me, it's not only the shape of the work, but it's the shape of Pendel's art practice altogether. It's something that goes forward and turns in on itself. And it moves like history, memory, and artistic ideas. And I've come to, be, to think about the spiral as a way to approach a lot of artist practice. It's also the way, uh, it's also become a great model for me to look at history. In fact, I've been encouraged by a certain West African idea, the concept of Sankofa. And Sankofa is a word in the Twi language from Ghana that translates loosely into go back and get that which may be left behind. Or, as I like to say, it really means to always remember history. Or, when going forward, also always remember to look back. So my engagement with African art and history gave me confidence to look again at African American artists, especially those who found inspiration in African art. But I've also learned something key from contemporary African curators. Using African ideas as a model doesn't simply mean adopting African forms and seeking similarities to my own American culture. It means looking at the context and being sensitive to the cultural and historical situations in different parts of the continent. It means basically learning from those uh, situations and those different cultures. Contemporary curators such as Okuyam Wazer and B.C. Silva taught me to learn from other cultures, not just look at them. This is what they call transcultural exchange. Transculturalism is different from a mere global exchange, which simply brings together different things based on surface similarities. This was the motto from Magicien de la Terre. And this is a lesson that can be used anywhere in the world. It's not just Africa to America, but it's about maybe the Caribbean to Europe and Asia to the Middle East. If you are judging from within the standards of one culture and insisting on implying those judgments that you have in one culture to another, then you're being insensitive at best, and at worst, in my opinion, lazy. So thank you.